Okay. So welcome everybody to our tutorial on automated performance analysis with Caliper, Spot, and Hatchet. So, so this um, tutorial covers three tools, um, Caliper, Spot, and Hatchet. Um, and they together enable you to implement um, automated performance analysis workflows for HPC software projects. So there are a lot of performance analysis tool out, tools out there already like um, Tau, HPC Toolkit, Score P and so on. Um, but these are what I would consider performance debugging tools. So um, you can use them to analyze a single program run uh, in depth to find a performance bottlenecks there. But as a result, these tools are usually more used um, retroactively and um, rather infrequently if you already uh, suspect a performance issue. But uh, we find it uh, extremely valuable to conduct performance analysis as a routine activity within the software development process. And to that end, we've come up with um, what we call the ubiquitous performance analysis approach, which um, essentially allows you to do anything from, well, automatically recording performance tests during nightly runs uh, up to essentially recording performance data for any um, program execution that you have if you're so inclined. Um, and this um, ongoing collection of um, program performance data and a variety of um, program configurations essentially gives you a whole um, wealth of data that you can then use to um, study the performance evolution of your code over time and um, just, yeah, uh, generate whole new insights as to how different program configurations perform and so on. So the three tools that we have to uh, implement this approach are Caliper, that's an instrumentation and profiling library. Then we have Spot, that is a web um, visualization toolkit for analyzing large collections of runs. And then we have Hatchet, that's a Python library for doing um, call graph analysis. And the typical um, use case that we have is usually performance regression testing. So you'd implement or instrument your application with Caliper and um, run performance tests that regularly collect performance data, for example, during your nightly unit testing. And then you can use Spot to um, look at actually all the data that you have collected so far and compare um, how performance evolved over time. And then you can um, develop custom analysis scripts in Hatchet to um, study certain aspects in detail. So this is the agenda for the tutorial. Um, we have roughly one hour each for um, each of the tools. So I'll start with the introduction of um, the Caliper Performance Profiling Library. Then we have a 15 minute break. Then Matt Legendre is um, going to analyze or well, going to present Spot. And um, finally at um, five Eastern, we have Olga who's gonna present um, core graph analysis with the Hatchet Python library. So the spot and hatchet parts have some hands-on exercises. And um, to do that, you can sign up to an AWS instance. And Matt, if you want to talk a bit about that. Yeah, David, could you go ahead and click that link? Um, I'll let you keep sharing as I talk, if you don't mind. So I'm also going to go post this link into chat for people. Um, feel free to co-click on this with us. So as David just said, the second part of these tutorials will be hands-on. David's gonna talk during the first part, mostly be presenting slides. And after that, David, um, actually you're still sharing your slide screen rather than the link. So we've, for the hands-on part, we have set up a currently 50 AWS instances where you can use this Google doc to claim one of the instances and one of the accounts in there. So what you can do is go through this doc and um, David, do you mind claiming instance one, user one? Um, go ahead and click on claimed by down here in this doc and edit that field. And David, go ahead and put your name over the claimed by. There you go. So what you can all do is go through this doc. Um, everyone should have edit permissions just through the link. Um, please be nice. Don't delete the whole doc on all of us or we'll have to go revert it and stick your name on one of these claimed by for spot user one or spot user two. Um, if we get way too many people, I'm gonna suggest only then start claiming spot user three or spot user four. But otherwise just find a slot in here, put your name down, uh, claim that. The links below where you claim 
our um, data sets that we will be using in the second and third part of the demo. Um, and then for the fourth part, that, or for the third part of the demo that Olga will present, we'll be using the link beneath the hatchet tutorial part. Are you welcome to go click on those right now? If you click on any of the spot, I mean, we'll be talking about them later, but if you click on any of the spot links, you'll be needing to use this. Um, everyone's got the same password, this U5D password to log into spot. And if you click the hatchet link, you'll need both the username and the password. Um, so go ahead and fill, fill this out right now. Find some spots for yourself. You can go all the way down. There's 50 instances right now, Plenty, uh, currently plenty, unless we get a lot more people. Um, find a spot um, and uh, hopefully then we'll be all ready to go when we're ready to start up the second uh, demo. And if you have questions, feel free to ask them in chat as David presents, or if you have any problems connecting, these will be good times to debug that. Um, hopefully these are all just web browser links and no one should have major issues, but I have to say that and then say knock on wood. All right, David, thank you. Thanks, Matt. So you already mentioned um, some housekeeping rules. So um, I think it's best if you have questions during the presentations to just ask them in the chat or raise your hands or something. And um, then one of our co-hosts should be able to um, forward the questions to me. Okay, I'll go ahead with the first part. That would be Caliber. All right, so Caliper, um, what is it? So as the title suggests, it's a performance profiling library. So the idea is that you can integrate um, performance profiling capabilities directly into your program, which has the advantage that, that it is always available. And um, it simplifies performance profiling for application end users because they don't have to use any complicated third party um, developer tools that they not, uh, might not be familiar with. So it's easy for end users also to um, generate performance data for your program. Um, in addition to being a profiling um, library, it's also a common instrumentation interface. So um, you can mark regions in your code and then use them in Caliper itself, but also um, provide this information to other performance profiling tools. It has a bunch of um, profiling features for typical HPC codes. So it supports um, all the typical programming models, MBI, CUDA, COCOS. And um, it has features like call stack sampling, hardware counters, memory profiling, and so on. So um, typical use cases include um, lightweight always on profiling. Um, so we can just, oops, let me go back there. Um, can just print a summary report of the performance of a program run in sort of a text form like we see um, in this um, text report above. Uh, you can use it for basic performance debugging tasks, so finding performance bottlenecks in your code. Um, it supports performance in introspection actually, so you can um, query runtime of your program from um, from your program itself. Um, we're not going to go into that in detail in this tutorial. Um, what we will cover, of course, are uh, comparison studies across runs. So um, you can set up automated workflows for performance regression testing and uh, configuration and scaling studies. And that's a big um, yeah, part of use cases that we use Caliper for. OK, so um, as I mentioned earlier, um, Caliper fits into um, an, a software ecosystem together with um, Spot and Hatchet. And Caliber is the instrumentation and profile component here. So it can record data for Spot, our visualization tool for analyzing um, huge amounts of um, runs. And from Spot, you can actually export data into Hatchet. And um, Caliber can also record data for Hatchet directly. OK, so here are a couple of um, links just for reference. So you find Caliper in its GitHub repository. Um, we have a separate documentation page. And if you have any questions, then I think the GitHub discussion page is the best place to go to. So any sort of support um, requests, please just put them there. Alternatively, you can also just um, contact me via email. OK. so. Let's go into using Caliber. So what do you have to do to actually, well, record performance data with Caliber? 
So this is sort of the um, step-by-step workflow. So first of course, you have to install Caliper and add it to your target code as a library dependency. Um, then instrument some source code regions. So Caliper is primarily a source code instrumentation library. Optionally, you can add program metadata annotations that describe um, what your current run is doing, like its configuration or um, build flags and things like that. Um, you don't need it for Caliper itself. You do, however, need it for um, analysis with spot um, later on. You can actually also control profiling within the program. You have a special API for that. And that's also optional. You don't have to go through that way, but it's um, a good opportunity. And finally, um, you run your program with a profiling configuration enabled and that will then record performance data. So let's go through these steps in a little bit more detail. Um, first, just really quick, um, I'm not gonna spend too much time here um, how you uh, obtain, build, and link developer. So you can um, install it manually. It has a CMake build system. Or the easier route is to use the spec package manager and install it through there. Um, what you have installed, um, you basically just link um, the Caliper library, libcaliper.so, to your program. And you can, if you use CMake in your project, um, use, um, yeah, use CMake's fine package support. So um, Caliper has um, a CMake package that you can use. And uh, then you have a CMake target available that you can just link to your application. OK, so. There are a few recommended options that we use for building Caliper if you choose to do it yourself. Um, one of them would be the RDAC library that's required for Spot, and it allows you to record program metadata. And you also need to enable MPI support for um, obtaining or for being able to use Spot with Caliper. So you don't have to have an MPI program to use um, Caliper for Spot, but it needs to be built with MPI support. And then there are a couple of additional options that will enable additional features like um, Puppy hardware counters, sampling, and um, CUDA support, and so on. Um, SPAC usually makes, makes that easier. So uh, most of these options are on by default in the SPAC package. And you basically just need to, ins say, um, SPAC install Caliper to get a fully equipped um, Caliper installation. And that's ready for Spot and also Hatchet. OK, so um, once you have Caliper linked to your code, um, it's time to mark code regions. So um, region profiling is kind of the core functionality of Caliper. It's essentially started out as an instrumentation library. So we have um, yeah, annotation macros and functions that you can use to mark um, functions in your code or uh, name certain code regions. So it's pretty simple with these um, begin end uh, macros or begin end functions in Fortran. So um, how do you actually go about marking um, a large code? So there are a couple of best practices here. So um, first of all, you should be selective. So these instrumentation annotations are meant to highlight or um, instrument high level program subdivisions. So you would instrument um, kernels, phases and such thing and not you know, every single line of code or every single function. So these annotations are not really meant to pinpoint specific bottlenecks but instead should allow you to um, yeah, study the performance of um, these kernels or, or phases that you choose um, in different program configurations, for example. If you do need more detail for performance debugging tasks, there are additional options that you can turn on, like um, call graph sampling and so on, that would give you more detail then without having to actually instrument um, yeah, um, higher level detail. Um, also be clear, so um, it's good to choose uh, main names that are meaningful to you as a developer. And um, yeah, just, just have descriptive names for your region. So these two points actually also illustrate why we do um, manual source code instrumentation. So um, that's because they give you the maximum amount of control. So you can control the um, instrumentation granularity, you can avoid clutter, and you can give your code regions uh, reasonable names. So um, for example, we have a code example here with a big Raja loop, well, a small Raja loop actually. Um, and you know in this case that this is your dog product and not whatever weird name the compiler would give this thing. 
Um, finally, it's a good practice to start small, so you can just add a few instrumentations um, and then add more as you go along. And actually, in practice, um, even in large codes, we typically have no more than a few dozen of these instrumented regions, so maybe like 20, 30 or so in total. So this is usually not too much work. And actually, a lot of the codes that we have already have um, built in or their own little timer libraries with instrumentation, we can usually just adapt these to use um, Caliber instrumentation instead. Okay. So now that we have region instrumentation in place, uh, we can actually start recording performance data. Um, the easiest way to do this is to use one of Calibre's built-in profiling configurations. And um, for example, we have one called runtime report and that measures, aggregates, and prints the time that you have spent in your annotated regions. So um, to enable that, you can use the Cali config environment variable so you say um, Kali config runtime report, run your program, and then it will print this report at the end. So runtime report isn't the only configuration. Um, as we've seen, this will um, just basically create a human readable report, but there are others that um, create um, profiling data that you can then process um, with Spot or say Hatchet or um, Calibre's own query tools. So for example, another um, configuration would be the Hatchet region profile, which would also essentially record the time um, spent in these annotated regions, but could use a JSON file that you can then load in Hatchet. So we have a lot of these built-in configurations and they cover um, a lot of common performance analysis use cases that you have. So here's kind of a little list. So we have the runtime report that we saw earlier. We have the loop report, which um, essentially prints iteration profiles. Um, then there are things like MPI report, CALPA sampling. And these would all basically print these human readable um, text reports that you can um, yeah, directly analyze. And then we have um, configurations that produce um, yeah, file for uh, files for post-processing with um, automated scripts or tools. Um, Catapult comes with a um, analysis program for its own data, um, the Cali query program or the MPI Cali query program. And um, this has this helpful um, help configs um, switch that you can use to list all the available um, program or profiling configurations and their options. So let's talk a little bit more about the um, configuration string syntax. So um, most of our profiling configurations have um, additional parameters that you can use to enable additional features, like um, say additional metrics or output options. So for example, the mem high watermark um, option would enable um, you to record uh, yeah, the maximum amount of memory that you had allocated in each annotated region. Um, the output option would allow you to redirect output to either a standard out, standard error, or um, a file. To use such parameters, you simply add them in parentheses after your config name. And um, if you're running just a single config, then you can actually even leave the parentheses away and just use commas. So in the case here, we are enabling the mem high watermark option and um, redirect output to standard out. So a lot of these options are um, applicable to different configs. So for example, we could use this mem high watermark options also on the hatchet region profile or um, the loop report, for example. Um, so what are, are a few examples? Um, one option is the profile MPI option that we can use with more profiling configurations like the runtime report and that um, instruments all the MPI functions in your code and you can see then the time that you spend in there. So that's typically quite helpful. Um, we have the same thing for CUDA profiling. So the profile CUDA option would enable you to um, analyze the time that you spend in CUDA runtime API calls like CUDA mem copy, CUDA yeah, kernel launch, CUDA device synchronize, and these kinds of things. Okay, so a kind of unique feature that Caliper has is the ability to control profiling programmatically. So this allows you to actually 
use um, program specific means to configure your program or, or to configure the profiling. Um, that's things like command line arguments, input files, and so on. And we usually find that that greatly increases the usability um, of performance analysis, especially for application end users, because they don't have to deal with some um, yeah, tools or external processes that they might, might not be familiar with, but they can just use um, familiar things like um, command line arguments to the program or program input files to uh, enable or disable and configure the profiling options. So um, what you can also do is actually start and stop profiling whenever you want and then and, and also control where you write outputs. So again, um, the API gives you more control than what you typically have when just using um, environment variables or things like that. So how do you use the profiling API? Um, well, you create one of these, um, a, an object for the caliber config manager class. Um, you can then use the add method to add a profiling configuration. This is using the same um, configuration string syntax that the Kali environment variable, that the Kali config environment variable does. So you can give it um, the runtime report config with um, any options for it. And then you use um, the start function to start profiling. You can use stop to pause it and um, flush to collect and write output. So an example here, we can now use a command line argument um, dash p runtime report to um, yeah, enable profiling rather than having to go through the environment variable. OK, so um, just as a comparison, there are a couple of ways to configure Caliper now. So we've learned the uh, Kali config environment variable. And um, you can use that if you don't want to use the config manager API. Um, you can use the config manager API to um, enable your built-in profiling configurations through some program-specific inputs like command line flags. And um, you can also create entirely custom measurement report configurations if none of the built-in ones do what you want. And um, yeah, that you do by um, selecting caliper configuration variables directly. We, we will not go into much detail with that here though. Okay, let's look at a couple more cool things that you can do with caliper. So um, one nice feature is um, the ability to forward annotations to third party tools. So a lot of performance analysis tools have um, instrumentation interfaces, um, kind of two specific ones. Um, things like um, NVIDIA's tools have the NVTX API, um, Rock Profiler has its own, then VTune and so on. And uh, we can forward Caliper annotations to these tools so you don't have to instrument your code with like 10 different annotation APIs for 10 different tools. So an example here, you're using the NVTX config and that will forward your Caliper annotations to um, NVIDIA's um, NVTX API that you can then be used with NVProf or um, NVIDIA's Insight tools. And there are similar options for VTune, for Tau, and in the next release also for Rock Profiler. Um, another cool thing is a loop profiling. So in addition to marking program, well, arbitrary program regions, we have specific macros for marking loops and loop iterations. And this then supports a couple loop profiling options. Um, like with the normal region profiling, it's best to be selective here. So um, don't instrument every single loop. Instead, it's meant to basically annotate your outer time stepping loop. What you can do then is um, generate a loop profile. So we have a config called loop report for that which prints a summary of your loop um, with the amount of iterations that you had in there, the time you spent in there, and then some metrics like um, the iterations per second and so on. You will also get an iteration summary, which um, as you can see, doesn't really print every single loop iteration here, but instead groups these iterations into blocks and then reports um, metrics like the iterations in each block, the time you spent in each block, and um, again, metrics like iterations per second. So this reduces the clutter that you get. Um, there are at most 20 of these blocks in a normal report. So you can control this um, in two different ways. 
So you can specify measurement intervals. So um, these loop measurement intervals can be time-based or iteration-based. That is, you can say, um, I want a loop iteration or I want a measurement after say half a second or so, or you can say, I want a measurement every 500 iterations and um, structure your measurements that way. So in the example here, we are measuring every 500 iterations and we see that in the example, well, um, each sub subsequent 500 iterations take longer than the previous one. So this loop is um, slowing down over time. Um, we can also specify iteration blocks. So the output is designed to essentially adapt to any loop length that you might have. And um, that's why these iterations are grouped into blocks and only um, a specified number of blocks are shown. By default, that's 20. But you can um, use the uh, time series max rows option to um, yeah, define the number of blocks that you want to see. And if you set it to three, then well, you're only going to see three blocks. And finally, you can disable this all and um, set an iteration interval of one and disable the blocking. And then it, the loop report will show and measure every single iteration. All right. Um, so Caterpillar obviously supports um, profiling for Hatchet. Um, there are actually two different profiling configurations that you can use to record data for Hatchet, the region profile and the sample profile. The region profile will um, record the time spent in your annotated code regions, whereas the sample profile will actually do call graph sampling and um, show you the time in each function, actually in each of your source code functions. So you can use that for more of a performance debugging use case. And of course, we go into detail into how you would use this data later in the hatchet part of the tutorial. Okay, finally, if um, none of the built-in configurations really does what you want to do, you can create your own configurations using manual configuration. So Caterpillar comes with a bunch of um, services um, that implement specific measurement functionality and you can compose and configure these services um, in a variety of ways. So in this um, pretty crazy example here, we're actually recording um, unified memory transfers between a CPU and a GPU, and then map them back to um, named memory regions as well as the functions where they originated from. And this will, in this case, produce a trace, and we can then use the Kali query program um, that has its own um, query language to produce this report that we see here. So um, again, I'm not going to go into too much detail, just to show um, the kind of things that you can do with Caliper. So it's a really um, flexible system that provides the building blocks that, that yeah, provides building blocks that you can use to create really custom um, performance analysis uh, yeah, examples yourself as well. Okay, so there's a bunch of ways that you can um, yeah, process data that you produce with Caliper. So um, again, we've seen all the built-in configs um, that directly produce human readable data. You can record data for spot. Um, you can use the um, hatchet specific um, configs to directly generate data for hatchet. And you can use all kinds of um, custom uh, measurement configurations to produce output that you can then um, analyze with um, the Cali query tool or um, also in an automated fashion with a Python reader library that we added recently. So again, I'm not going to go into detail here. Um, just shows a good example of um, the amount of ways that you can use Caliber. Okay. So um, Um, this part um, covered basically the usage of Caliper in general, and now let's go into more detail as to how you would use Caliper to record data for the spot um, performance analysis or the spot visualization and analysis framework. So here's essentially the workflow that you can use. So on the left side, we have kind of the changes that you need to make to your program to enable spot. And on the right side are the things that you would do at uh, runtime for an individual program run. 
So um, Spot works with uh, region time profiles, just like the runtime report essentially. So um, the first thing we want to do is again add region instrumentation to the code. Um, but now we also want to add metadata um, that describe um, our specific program runs. Because remember, um, Spot isn't really about um, analyzing an individual program run, but instead um, huge collections of runs, potentially all of the um, performance data that you have collected so far. And it doesn't really make sense to compare data from a 1D test program with a 3D um, production problem. So you want to distinguish those. And in addition, you can use this uh, metadata to conduct performance analysis of its own. So for example, you might want to um, record the MPI job sizes to do scaling studies, or you might want to record the program configuration to um, see how performance um, changes with different program configurations and so on. Or you might want to check um, how does um, user Bob run his program versus how the developers run their program. So um, that's all metadata that's really helpful to have and enables um, a whole new level of performance analysis with all these comparisons between different runs. We have actually developed a new library to collect this kind of information that's called ADIAC. And um, ADIAC, well, it quotes program specific metadata and also kind of um, common ones. And we'll go into that a little bit later. And um, it will feed it into Caliper and um, that will write it then into the spot data sets. So finally, we need um, a way to configure Caliper so you can use the Cali config environment variable or the config manager interface. And once all that is in place, um, you can run the program with the specific spot configuration. And this will produce an output file in Caliper's own .cali format that goes into um, an experiment directory, which you can then point the spot web interface to. So um, all these parts are usually, <clears throat> excuse me, going to be automated in some form. So um, if you're doing something like performance regression testing, then that is probably going to end up in your continuous integration scripts. And usually it's not too much that you have to change there, essentially just um, run your test programs that you are um, interested in with the caliper spot configuration, and then just move these files around into a specified directory. Okay, so let's um, take a closer look at ADIAC. So this is a C and C++ library for recording program metadata. And um, it has essentially two types of functions. So um, it has um, built-in functions to collect some common metadata, like say the username, um, the launch date, um, the MPI job size, and so on. And then it has key value functions where you can record um, custom program specific uh, metadata information, mostly um, the program configuration. So um, what would you typically record? So we usually recommend, well, um, one thing that's required is actually the launch date because a lot of the displays inside spots are based on that. And um, other things that we usually record are well MPI job sizes, usernames, um, number of OpenMP threads, and so on. And in terms of custom metadata, we typically record all the program configuration options. So basically anything that would in, uh, impact your pro program performance and that you might want to do uh, comparisons on is a good candidate for recording in RDIAC. Um, in addition, we also um, typically record some global performance metrics for the entire run, like some sort of figure of merit value or the total runtime that the program took. So um, here's the couple of functions that ADIAC has to collect um, common metadata. So there's all kinds of things like usernames and user IDs, um, the command line and so on, and um, also the wall time at the end of the program. So I'm not going to go into detail here, um, just kind of an overview. Then there are um, several ways of collecting this custom key value data. Um, there's a C++ interface that actually supports a lot of um, data types. Um, so you can record um, both simple data types like strings, integers, floating points. Um, you can kind of record specially designated strings like um, a path or a program version. And you can also record um, structure types like lists or uh, arrays or tuples and so on. 
And this RDF value function in C++ has overloads for many different data types. You have a similar interface in C, and this uses kind of a printf style um, descriptive syntax, where you can also, again, in record all sorts of data types. Okay, how are we doing time-wise? I think I still have 10 more minutes or so. Um, so once you have your um, Caterpillar region instrumentations and um, RDIAC metadata um, records in place, um, you can run the program um, with the spot configuration. And um, as I said, um, it's, it kind of works like the runtime report, except it writes a, a machine readable file. So um, it aggregates and records the time spent in your instrumented regions, and it actually also supports a lot of the similar um, profiling options that you can use on runtime reports. So for example, you can enable um, MPI profiling, CUDA profiling, and um, various different metrics and so on. So again, the, the configuration will produce this um, .cali output file, which has kind of an auto-generated name by default. And um, you put that in a directory that you can then load in Spot. So Spot also supports loop profiling, actually. So you enable this with the um, time series option. So you set time series to true. Then you get a loop profile if you have any loop instrumentations in your code. And you can also enable um, metrics for your loop profile, um, like memory bandwidth recording. And um, then in Spot, you can see various uh, or especially view for um, analyzing this time series data that you recorded. Okay, so in the last part of this, um, of the uh, Caliper tutorial, I'll walk you through a, an example of how we modified um, the Lulish proxy app with Caliper and Adiac. So Lulish is actually the example that we're gonna use in the spot and hatchet parts of the tutorial. So let me just show you what we did there to record the data. So um, you can find this, um, uh, this modified uh, Lulish version in um, a GitHub repository that I mentioned there. I'll probably put the link in the chat eventually. And um, yeah, this is aug augmented with the config manager interface so you can um, enable performance profiling as a command line flag and then print a runtime report for your Lulash run. So um, in Lulash, we find that um, the top level functions actually provide a meaningful basis for performance analysis. So we just um, use Caliper's um, function annotation macro to annotate some of the functions. So we annotated 17 out of the 39 existing computational functions and also five um, high level communication functions in Lulash. Um, that might or might not work um, for a real code. So um, in some programs, you might have to use the um, explicit begin end markers, but in Lulash, the function names were actually quite helpful. Um, we also annotate the main loop with uh, Caliper's um, loop annotation macros. So this helps us, or this lets us generate um, time series profiles for Lulash. Um, finally, we um, added, as I mentioned, the Config Manager API. So in this case, it lets us um, read um, profiling configuration strings from the command line and um, yeah, just enable profiling like that. Okay, so um, we also record a bunch of metadata in, Adi uh, in Lulash with Adiac. So um, these are typical um, common metadata information like the username, large date, and so on. And um, also we record all of the Lulash configuration options that you can add as additional command line flags. So this would be things like the iteration count, problem size, um, and has this notion of regions that we also record and um, region balances and so on. And we also record global performance metrics um, like the total elapsed times and um, the figure of merit that um, Lulash computes at the end so it will help us just to, um, yeah, uh, to a, a course analysis of performance of different runs with different configurations. Okay, 
So finally, integrating um, Caliper and Adiac into the build system was also relatively straightforward. Um, this version of Lutash actually has a CMake build system. So we just um, add the packages for Caliper and Adiac there. And um, yeah, link it to the Lutash executable. That's pretty straightforward, actually. OK, so. Um, that was the Caliper tutorial. Um, do we have any questions? I think we have a bit of time to answer questions. So just raise your hand if you have any or put in the chat. Let's see. Okay. Oop. Let me see. So, so Cyan has a question. Uh, hi, David. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Are there any plans to uh, include OpenMP device offload uh, for cali caliper profiling? Um. No concrete plans yet. I think we can include it in, in the long run. So I'm currently working on OMPT support um, first for host side, but um, I think we can certainly also consider device side and um, support there as well. Thanks. Any other questions? Just raise your hands. There's another question in chat, David. Okay. Uh, this is hard to find when you are actually sharing. Let's see. Where is it? You can probably stop sharing. Okay. That make things easier. So, do, 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 do. so what kind of overhead do we expect and tolerate? So um, it depends on the measurement configuration that you run. So um, Caliper is configured at runtime. You can configure it to do um, lightweight kind of profiling, so just like simple region profiling, which doesn't have too much overhead, um, or enable yeah more advanced or more detailed options like say MPI profiling that would add more overhead. So um, generally, we advise to um, yeah keep the region instrumentation relatively sparse. So that way, um, if you do use Caliper as sort of an always on instrumentation interface, it's not going to interfere too much. Um, generally, for things like region profiling, I think um, on our systems, at least on our Intel clusters, like the um, absolute time that you need to record a timestamp is about like 0.1 microseconds or so. So that should give you an idea of what to expect um, in terms of instrumentation overhead. But yeah, it highly depends on the specific measurement configuration and your instrumentation granularity. So we have a couple more questions. Um, do, 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 do. What's the difference between Caliper and Tau? So, um, yeah, Tau is a pretty comprehensive performance analysis framework. Um, it is one of these things that I consider a performance debugging tool. So it allows you to, well, basically record any kinds of performance data for individual program runs. So um, I would say that the main difference is that Tau is a tool and Caliper is a library. So Caliper is kind of meant to be always integrated into the program so that you can record performance data whenever you want. Whereas with Tau, you basically use it as a separate tool for an individual run. And um, also, well, Caliper is kind of geared toward this um, approach of um, collecting performance data for a lot of, um, yeah, essentially a lot of different runs with different program configurations, whereas um, Tau is geared toward analyzing individual runs. But 
there is interoperability between those tools. So um, you can, for example, forward caliper annotations to Tau if you want to. All right, just figured out I can't get to Zoom while I'm in presentation view. So we're up to 1230, so I'm going to get going. I didn't see any messages in chat from anyone struggling with the um, AWS instances and starting up the web container there. So hopefully that means that everything's working perfectly smoothly. Yay, hooray. So I'm gonna take about just 10 minutes of slides here to do a pretty, a kind of high level walkthrough of the spot interface and some of the goals. And then we're going to switch to the hands-on part after that, where we'll all fire up spot together and walk through it. But to start with, so David's been telling us about how you could integrate caliper into your application and performance analysis instead of being some separate tool floating off out there that you run whenever you need it um, is instead something that's built into your app and you could then run performance analysis either all the time or very frequently you could run performance analysis on your the nightly tests for your application you could run performance analysis when developers are doing um you know, studies and test runs of their own. You could run performance analysis when your end users run the application. If you have user Bob, you could have Bob have performance analysis turned on and you could collect all of that data, which, you know, sounds great. You could build up a whole performance lifetime in your application that way, understanding how your performance has changed from your first release to, you know, your current day or between releases, um, except boy, that's a lot of data. So now we're gonna shift a little bit from what David talked about with the collection of performance analysis data into how we would go about managing that performance analysis data. Um, and to do that, we're gonna use Spot, which is a web-based tool that we've developed. Now Spot differs from a lot of the other performance tools in that it's, it's not the strongest tool if you're just pointing it at one run that you've done. You know, you say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run my app once and then load it up in Spot. You, you can absolutely do that, but that's not really where the strength lies. The, the strength of Spot is at pointing it at 100 runs um, or 1,000 runs. And we're gonna walk through three scenarios um, of uh, when, it, particularly when we get to the hands-on, um, we're going to point it at some nightly test data, and we're going to build some, do some regression analysis in Spot to see if performance has changed over time in our nightly tests. Um, we're going to do a quick MPI scaling study with Spot. Um, we're going to, I ran uh, Lulash a whole bunch of times at different scales, and we're going to do some strong and weak scaling tests with it. Uh, tests, uh, performance analysis with it. And finally, we're going to walk through a scenario where we look at performance analysis data as if it were submitted by a bunch of users, users who maybe have individual performance problems or idiosyncrasies when they run. And we're going to try to identify some particular users who might be having performance problems or uniqueness, maybe I could phrase it. Um, things I'm not going to cover in this, I'm not actually going to talk about one of the hardest parts about Spot, which is how to deploy it. Spot's, Spot's a web app. You need to deploy it with a web server. We have a container that you can go download from GitHub and build this container and run it. And this container will run a web server. And um, this web server, though, will uh, 
Well, it needs access to the performance data that you've collected with Caliper. Now, uh, that could mean that you go run the web server on some front end node of a cluster. Maybe if the admins allow web servers to run on an HPC system, maybe it means you run this uh, container on your laptop and you move the performance data over to the uh, laptop whenever you want to do analysis. If you're at LLNL, we've posted spot at a, a local website, you can run it and immediately access all the data that might exist on a, uh, on a cluster here. But you've essentially going to have a problem of where do I, where can I safely run a web server and how can I get that, my data to that location? And I'm going to punt on that issue for this. If you want to message us and talk to us and figure out the best ways to do it for your scenario, uh, feel free, but we're not going to cover that in this tutorial. All right, moving on. The, the larger piece of the spot workflow um, is that you point spot and some collection of performance data. And we currently do that by you point spot at a directory. Um, maybe you, you've collected a bunch of Cali file, dot Cali files from Caliper. You stick them all in a directory or some directory hierarchy. You point spot at the top level of that directory. At a high level, and we'll go through this more, we're going to be then selecting an interesting set of runs to analyze. Um, David said this earlier, but there's some runs you've probably done that don't make sense to compare. Um, small rinkadink 1D tests versus three-dimensional multi-physics runs. There's no interesting performance comparison there. So we're going to look for ways to slice the data and make interesting comparisons. Um, spot then we'll do a lot of what we I'm going to call the common or the analyses. The things we we believe that you're going to want to do most often with your performance analysis data graph a history of performance changes, um, see, realize that whenever user Bob runs, the whole center falls over and performance takes a nosedive. But we're not going to do some of the more advanced analyses in spot. Um, that's going to be where Hatchet and the third part of this tutorial kicks in. If you say to me, oh, I want to invert all my performance data and view it upside down with error bars between runs, I don't know. You can make up all this performance data visualization stuff. That's Hatchet. So we'll go to there later. When we first load up Spot, you're going to see something vaguely familiar to this screen. Um, again, we'll load it up in a few minutes. Um, there's a few major parts that we're going to be walking through. Uh, David talked about the metadata you can collect with Audioc. That's going to be visible in this top part uh, here uh, for all your runs. We're going to have performance data that you're going to be able to compare against uh, for many runs some configurations and a place where your data source is. Um, alternatively, you, you could come up and you might see the table view instead of the comparison view, which rather than compare all your data, it lists individual runs. And if you turn up wanting to do operations on specific runs, you'll do that through this table view. Um, again, we're, we're gonna get to this. The whole spot model is um, based on a data analytics visualization uh, package called CrossFilter. There's a couple implementations out there. Spots based out of one called dc.js. Um, there's another one out there called, uh, from the D3 project called CrossFilter. CrossFilter is a really good way at finding, comparing data and finding correlations between data. Um, if you want to ignore me and my talking for a few minutes, you could click on this second link. It'll take you to a CrossFilter example where you can look at a bunch of flights from early 2001 and see if you can identify uh, who caused most of the late flights in, in the first months of early 2001. Here's a hint, it's Phoenix. But it's really good for exploring massive amounts of data like that. Um, now, every time you run, uh, David covered this, but every time you run with Caliper and Audioc, you collect two major categories of data. You collect a set of metadata and Spot's going to visualize that for you as histograms. Um, these are This is a histogram of launch dates from a bunch of runs. And this shows, for some time period, how many runs happened in that time period, that bucket of time that Spot grouped it into. Um, so in late February, it looks like we had 20 and 20 and 22-ish runs. So you know, 62 runs in this time period. Performance data, we're going to start seeing visualized as flame graphs if the data is associated with code. 
So in this case, Maine is my top entry here, took 100% of the time, and Lagrange nodal is a couple layers underneath, and it took a second-ish of total time. Or if we have performance data that associates with time, we're going to view that as a time series graph. The most common example of that is both, well, the two common examples is things like memory bandwidth data, which is associated, I had this much memory bandwidth happening at this time, or the kind of loop analysis that David showed earlier. Um, the metadata that we're going to look at can be filtered. So when I mentioned those histograms, you can select a region of metadata with your mouse, just click and drag, and that will select a subset of the data. So in this case, I highlighted that later week in February, and I selected the 62 runs that are part of this. When we do this, every other operation subsequently in spot until we reset this right here, will operate on just that subset of data. So if I went and said, now I want to do a comparison view, I would only compare the runs that happened in this week if I wanted to um, do another subselection on the second metadata. Maybe I went and picked everything that came from the GCC compiler. I would only be seeing runs that were GCC runs in this period. And the table view will filter down to show how many runs you actually have. Um, we will be... Um, there's different metadata we can turn on and off. Um, there's a whole bunch that's collected. We can only visualize, we can choose to visualize only small pieces of it. Um, so for example, one of the first things we'll do in every one is we'll click this check mark and we'll turn on some of the more interesting metadata. Um, you can also create custom metadata fields by adding and subtracting, multiplying, or string concatting existing metadata. We'll, we'll play with that a little bit. Um, at times, we'll, we'll be doing comparison views, but we'll also be doing views of individual data. That's done from the table view. We've got buttons here. Um, you've got a time button, which will show flame graphs for that run for every metric that was part of a run. There's if, if data has time series associated with it, we've got a time series graph. And if you click the Saturn buttons, those launch Jupiter. I'm well aware Saturn and Jupiter aren't the same planet. I've, I've got a to-do list to find a more planet appropriate icon. Feel free, to, feel free to judge us for that. When we do comparisons, we're gonna be looking at stacked line charts, um, which are gonna be zoomed in at a certain layer of your run. You know, It starts showing the performance of Maine. You click on that and there's a layer of annotations beneath that that it'll show the performance of. Um, and that'll be associated with a flame graph as well. Um, again, we're going to go through this in just a minute. And that is my cue to switch to the live demo. I'm going to stop sharing and take a look for questions really quick. No one's got any questions. You can't all hear me, right? No, nope. all right. People have comments. All right, you can hear me. Okay, hopefully everyone has a... Uh, let me, I need to reshare and show my web browser. Hopefully everyone has been able to claim a AWS instance running spot. Uh, share screen. Okay. Um, let me, all right, that's, Good, but now Zoom is covering the parts I want to click on up there. That's unfortunate. I need to move everything left. Do you see my web browser? I can't see chat. Could someone unmute and say whether or not you see my web browser? We can see. Yep. You might want to make it larger because right? you got two giant bars of white space on either side that are going unused. How's that? That's way better. All right. So I've already opened up my links, um, but if you go to the Google, Google Docs for the area that you've claimed, you should be able to click on the link for the MPI data set. That's where I'm going to start. Now, um, here's something I'm not entirely sure the best way to do these virtual tutorials. If we were sitting in a room, I'd throw my screen up on a projector. You could fire up your own instances there, and you could follow along and click on the same things I click on. Um, but we, we, we're not sitting in a room together. 
So what you could do, maybe if you have two screens up, it might be nice to put my view in one screen and your web browser with your spot instance in another, and you can follow along as I click on things. Um, if you only got one screen, I'm going to try to talk through what I click on, and you could listen to me and try to click on the same things, or you could watch my presentation. For the first two data sets, it's going to be very guided. I'm going to be doing the clicking and asking you to, and now you click on this. Uh, for the third one is more, I'm going to turn you guys loose and let you see what you can figure out about which users are behaving badly and how's the performance, uh, you know, now which users are behaving badly sums it up. So hopefully everyone's got the MPI data set up. Um, if not, feel free to post questions in chat and maybe one of the other moderators or someone can help you. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click the check mark that is the middle button in the upper right. And I'm gonna turn on some more interesting metadata than this. I'm gonna turn on how many hosts we had, num hosts. I'm gonna click that check mark. I'm gonna turn on the problem size. I'm going to click that check mark. I'm going to turn on the job size over in the rightmost column. I don't care about the user in this case. I don't care about the launch date. Uh, these are the defaults that Spot opens first time, but these can be remembered and changed. Um, and let's see, what else do I want to turn on? Uh, the figure of merit. I always like having the figure of merit up. Um, so right now I have figure of merit, job size, num hosts, and problem size turned on. We're gonna use this MPI data set. We're gonna pretend like we were a developer who ran Lulush a bunch of times. And now we wanna do a weak and strong scaling studies of each run that we did. Um, before I really delve into it though, let's re-see some of the features I talked about. Um, so I'm going to, I turned off the, uh, the metadata on and off. I un I'd clicked the checkbox in the middle again, and I turned that off. So I'm gonna highlight, click and drag on the figure of merit graph. And I'm going to highlight the rightmost bars. Now, what I did here is the cross filter selection. That means I only want to view the runs that had the highest figure merit. And I can see, not too surprising, these are the runs that had the biggest job sizes. Um, let's see, these high figures of merit happened with both medium and high problem sizes and the highest number of hosts. That's We'll, we'll find some interesting correlations later. That's not a particularly surprising one. Um, so I'm going to reset my figure of merit view, go back to the original. Um, I'm going to scroll down here, and I'm going to go down to the table. Um, just as some more examples of what we saw earlier, I could click on the wall time button here, which is the little clock next to any of the runs. That pops up a new tab. And for this run that I made, here I collected what, four metrics, um, time, max time, and min time per rank, and a total time. And I can see the flame graph um, context performance trees for those runs, as well as the metadata for that run. I'm not gonna linger here, so I'm gonna close that tab that I opened up. We'll get to these Saturn slash Jupiter buttons in a minute. But the most important thing for right now is I'm gonna click the compare tab. Um, which is next to table, and that's going to take away my table view. So what I want to do here is I'm going to start, um, let's start with a strong scaling study. So I'm going to make comparison graphs of all the runs I have selected. Um, and maybe let's, let's start, let's keep it easy. Let's strong scale study the largest problem size. I'm going to go click uh, the problem size metadata chart, and I'm gonna highlight just the rightmost bar to start with. Okay, and that says, I'm only now looking at 15 records of the original 75, because I highlighted just a subset of them. I'm gonna say for my x-axis on my graph, I wanna see the job size. Um, if multiple runs are on the same point in the x-axis, um, I'm gonna say how to aggregate them. I'm just gonna average them. For my y-axis, I'm going to look at the average time per rank. And oh, did I do something wrong? I probably did. I want to group by, let me reset the problem size. Um, what am I doing wrong? Job size. This worked for me earlier. Of course, I have live demo problems now. Why wouldn't you do this in all my practice runs? 
I swear it was working. I should be getting a graph here. Oh, Matt, try refreshing my page. This isn't something that would normally happen. This is the first time I'm seeing something like this. Hmm. Refreshing the page helped. I guess I have a bug somewhere. It might be in this AWS instance stuff. I'm only using AWS for the first time. But it Maybe could also better. be your, your screen size, because remember we had you enlarge it. Oh, and you did. I don't usually run at that screen size. I'm, I'm going to blame screen size. Thank you, Todd. All right, I'm going to go back and select just the highest problem size. So what I've got here is for a given problem size, problem size 50 on Lulesh, um, per job rank, here it, per job size that I ran here, here is the performance study. This is the performance of main. I can, my mouse is when it's over a point, there's some set of runs that are under this point. Um, I can see those runs in the flame graph at the bottom of my screen and I can start clicking here, drill down beneath main. Now I'm looking at the time of Lulesh cycle. Click again, I'm looking at the time of uh, the time increment and Lagrange leapfrog functions. I could choose to zoom in on one of these. Um, let's look at Lagrange leapfrog by clicking the brown. Now I'm looking at the next layer. So I'm kind of cycling through the layer of, um, by clicking on these, I'm cycling through what part of the context tree I'm visualizing right now. I could go down, I could see some MPI functions starting to happen, MPI wait all is really going down in time, surprisingly, uh, as I get to bigger time periods. Um, and right now I'm just looking at a strong scaling study for one, uh, for the largest problem size. I'm gonna go up to my metadata. I'm gonna re click reset on the problem size. And um, when I did that, I started aggregating a whole bunch of problem sizes under one thing here. I'm going to change group by to problem size. This says how many graphs to make. If I have for every unique value of problem size, spot's going to make me one graph. Now I have problem size 10, problem size 20, 30, 40, and 50. Um, you'll notice that uh, Lulesh isn't doing very great strong scaling here. These should be going down a lot more. I'm going to go up to the top layer. Uh, I believe that is because I built a bunch of MPIs with uh, SPAC and I don't think I had SPAC use the right fabric. So I think I've got MPIs using TCP IP, um, but that's a performance problem. So that's nice to see here. Um, we also might want a weak scaling study. So that'll be if we fix the amount of work per rank. Now to do that, I'm gonna scroll all the way back to the top and I'm gonna to need to make a new metadata value that is work per rank. So I'm gonna click the plus icon on the very top of the screen. And I'm gonna make a new metadata. I'm gonna to go to problem size in my add chart that I got. I'm gonna add problem size three times because the Lulesh problem size is the size of its edge cubed. And I'm gonna, after adding that three times, I'm gonna multiply all three of those together. I'm going to add a new row. I'm going to divide the multiplied problem size by the job size, job size. And I'm going to call this in the chart name, uh, work per rank, problem size cube divided by job size. And when I did that, I got a new metadata value. And in this case, I'm going to highlight a thousand because I, I know when I ran this, I had a bunch of runs of a thousand per rank. I'm going to turn off my group by in the chart. And now for a fixed problem size per rank, I can see my weak scaling. Um, how many runs, uh, what was the performance of these runs? Uh, again, I'm getting very bad Lulesh scaling, but that's Lulesh uh, and how I built it, not Spot. Um, I can't see the chat screen. I really wish I could. Are there any questions so far that I should address? None yet. I hope that means everyone's happy. All right, let's move on off of the MPI data um, and let's go to the test data. You'll find a link to the test data back in the Google Docs. Um, 
This is a large data set, and those are some rather small, dinky little AWS instances I grabbed. This can take 15 or 20 seconds to load uh, when you click it. Um, if I run spot on my laptop, it's like two or three seconds. So that, that's kind of how dinky that AWS instance is. Um, so I'm just going to talk about how dinky those are while you guys get an opportunity to load this data set. And what we're going to do here is we're going to do a nightly test performance uh, regression comparison. Uh, what I did is I ran Lulash. I created kind of a fake metadata value called test with a bunch of different test names. And for each test of Lulash, I ran it with certain properties to kind of create individual performance characteristics of these. And the first thing I'm going to do after I load up the test um, data set is I am going to click that check mark again. I'm going to turn on some more interesting properties, some met metadata. I'm going to turn on the compiler. I want to see which compilers are being used. I'm going to turn on the figure of merit, um, the job size. I'm going to turn off launch date, and I'm going to turn on launch day. Launch date is the date and time your job ran, launch day truncates off the time. Um, so it's just the day you ran. So if you ran all your night, your nightly tests over one day, um, they'll all bucket together under one launch day. Um, I'm gonna, I don't remember if I need to turn on MPI here. Is there a uniques? No, everyone's got the same MPI. I'm gonna not turn on MPI. Um, I'm gonna turn on the number of hosts. I'm gonna turn on the problem size. Oh, test is a very important one to turn on for this data set. I'm going to turn off user, uh, turn on threads. So right now I've got compiler, figure of merit, launch day, numhost, prom size, test, and threads turned on. I'm going to click the check mark again to hide all that metadata. And um, before I really delve into building the performance comparison, let's just take a glance through the data. My favorite thing is always highlight the top figure of merit and see what's happening. Oh my goodness. Clang dominates the highest figure of merits. Things built with Clang. That's interesting. Um, and I always like to highlight the lowest figure of merit bar. Um, well, it looks like everyone gets, gets a share of the lowest. Um, I could also go inside the compiler. I could click Clang and yeah, that, that, that's similar to the whole view. I could click Intel. Um, looks like it might be just a little generally lower than the Clang. Um, but the more interesting thing here is building the nightly tests. Um, oh, one thing I haven't done, let's see. Now let's build the nightly test comparison page first. So I'm gonna scroll down to the bottom and I'm gonna click the compare tab again. In this case, and let's hope the compare page works out of the gate. I'm gonna make my x-axis the launch day. I wanna compare over time. Um, if there's multiple runs in one day, I'm gonna say, let's average those together. Um, I'm gonna to talk about, let's say the average time per rank uh, for the y-axis. And for the group by, I'm gonna make that field test. I wanna see a graph per test. And it's kind of doing it again. I don't know what's happening. Why are you doing this during my demo? All right, I'm going to refresh the page. While I'm refreshing and paying that 20 second load all that data penalty, uh, I'll point out that as I clicked a bunch of things, they started representing that in my URL. Uh, you can bookmark this URL. You could share it with anyone else. They will get the same uh, page that you just constructed as you clicked on all these things. Let's see. There we go. I don't know why you're doing that. Um, this is the same view we saw last time. <sighs> Let me get some water. <clears throat> Except now I'm looking at the performance of these tests over time. And I can scroll down here and I can start to see a trend that on February 16th or so, a lot of tests slowed down or just suddenly got noisy. Oh, right. If this were a real app, I would be saying, oh, maybe someone made a commit there 
and really made a performance regression in the code. And Spot's not immediately going to tell you what commit or what the exact problem is. I could drill down. Um, it kind of looks like it might be across the board. I'm seeing this in two different regions. Um, this apply material properties really got slower. Eval, yeah, it kind of looks like an across the board slowdown. Um, so I would know then to go look for a performance regression in that area um, around that time period. Maybe I would fire up Tau, maybe I would fire up HPC Toolkit and really try to do a deep dive on the performance analysis here. Um, I'm gonna go back to the main top level view. Uh, one thing you might have noticed is all this metadata on the right. What this is, is if there's a bunch of runs underneath my cursor right now, right now there's three runs, that's the number of records, they have metadata. And if they have a common piece of metadata, it's gonna tell me what that metadata is. Everything under my cursor was test thread scale. Um, well, you can see thread scales, the second graph there. I'll run with the MP, that batch too. They had a different set of libraries between each of them and different executable paths. We, we don't show that right now. Uh, one thing you can do with Spot when you have this kind of nightly test page is pretty quickly pivot how you're looking at things. So maybe you find there's something interesting about, let's pick this test medium. So I wanna dig into what's going on in test medium a little bit. I'm gonna scroll back to my metadata. I'm gonna click in the big pie chart of tests. Um, incidentally, if we got more than I think 16 tests here, this would turn into a list selection view. Um, I'm gonna click on medium. And now I've only got one graph, the same graph that I had before, but I'm gonna change group by to compiler. And now I'm looking at per, for this one test, what is the performance for each compiler? Uh, ooh, looks like Clang is um, staying a lot steadier than uh, Intel and GCC. Interesting, whatever performance regression happened there uh, didn't seem to affect Intel. Um, I'm gonna reset the test field. I could also do things like um, maybe I could view performance on just a certain cluster. Um, if I had the, if I'd run this on many clusters, I could pick a cluster and zoom in on that or a cluster or an architecture. Um, I could pick lots of variables and pretty quickly change my view here on how I group things. Okay. I'm going to click back to the table view. Um, I'm going to reset my test. Um, let's see, so I'm viewing everything. One thing I haven't clicked yet is our Saturn slash Jupiter button. Um, and I'm going to do that right now. So when you click the Saturn button that's in the table view associated with one run, what you do is you get a Jupiter notebook for that run. Oh. Uh, before I started this demo, I already had logged into Jupyter Hub. Um, if you click that button, you may have to log in for the first time if you haven't already. Your username is either spot user one or spot user two, depending what you signed up for. And it's the same U5 password that you use to log into spot. Uh, you should have that on the machine, on the um, Google Docs. Um, Olga is gonna talk a lot more about what you can do with Jupyter Notebook in general. But by default, you just get a real quick sample notebook with hatchet in it that you can do, you can operate on the performance data from that run. I'm gonna click run a few times and the default one just prints out the call tree for that run and a table view of performance for that run. Um, you could modify this, you can change it, you can get your own notebooks going on this data and you could do, well, Olga's gonna show you some of the crazy things you can do. Um, I'm gonna close this, leave that page. Um, how many runs do I have? I'm gonna zoom in on a few runs. Let's grab this set. Um, how many do I have? That's still more than I want. I'm gonna filter a few times and just grab a smaller group of data. I grabbed the first few launch days. I grabbed the uh, highest thread count. Looks like I have a small set here, 15 records now. And I'm gonna click the Jupyter M button. This is the multi-Jupyter notebook. And for all the runs I had selected there, it's gonna load all of them into a Jupyter notebook. And this is another kind of sample notebook, just give you some ideas on what it can do. The sample one does some things where it just compares two of the runs, um, 
prints one of the runs graph. Uh, what's the next thing it's going to do? Similar in a different format. Um, it's going to compute a difference between two of the runs by dividing the performance of one run with another. Um, subtract the performance of one run from another. Again, Olga will give you some more examples of the kind of things you can do here, but it is a sample notebook to give you examples of what you can do here, and you can do larger operations on this data. You can transform it. I'm going to close that Jupyter notebook again. All right. Um, are there any questions so far on what I've talked about? Again, I can't see the chat. If not, we'll be jumping to the third data set, and this is where I'm going to turn you guys a little more loose. No questions yet. Um, that's either good or bad. I'm going to be optimistic and assume good. All right. Let's fire up the third data set. Now, what I did here is um, I pretended like I was a whole bunch of people and I ran Lulesh using, well, some a little bit of random shuffling, but a whole bunch of characteristics of these users. Some of these users are getting really bad performance. Some of them are doing other things that are kind of bad. Some of them are getting good performance. Um, and what I'm gonna do is give you guys about five, 10 minutes. If you wanna kind of play with the data, see, see if you can figure out who's doing what, who's misbehaving. Um, and just to start you off though, I'm gonna I'm gonna help you turn on some interesting metadata given given that I know what what I did when I ran this and what things are interesting. So I'm gonna click that same check mark again. I'm gonna turn on the compiler. I'm gonna turn on the um, figure of merit. That'll be a really useful one for you. I'm gonna turn on the job size. Um, keep the launch date on. I'm gonna turn on which MPI was used. I'm going to turn on the number of hosts. I'm going to turn on the problem size. I'm going to turn on, test isn't interesting this time, the number of threads, uh, the user, and the version. I've got a whole bunch of metadata on this time. I've got compiler, figure of merit, job size, launch day, MPI, number of hosts, problem size, threads, user, and version. I'm going to click the check mark to turn all those off. Um, Scroll through here, I can see all the metadata I turned on. And, um, you know, a first question is who, who's getting the worst performance and what are they doing? Um, I'm going to, there's a lot of us in the chat, but I'm going to say, why don't we, why don't we feel free to try to open this up a little bit? If someone wants to speculate or look into this and, and say what they think, who's got bad performance? It'll take five minutes here. And I'm going to see if there's a way for me to see chat while I, while I let people play with that. Oh, there it is. I can pop up a little chat window. No one is commenting anything. Anyone figured out who's behaving badly? Bob is responsible for it. Yeah, thank you. It is Bob. Bob. I had an uncle named Bob. I loved Bob, but um, I always blame Bob for things. So yeah, we can select the lowest figure of merit here, just that bottom bar. And um, boy, Bob is a significantly disproportionate amount of that low figure of merit. Um, that's interesting. So I'm going to go back up. I'm going to clear my figure of merit bar there. Um, and I'm going to come down and let's focus on Bob. I'm going to click on Bob. What is Bob doing? Well, he's running with all different versions. So he, he's keeping up on the versions as we release him. He's um, not using any threads. He's got six, well, maybe 70 some runs there. Um, they're all one thread. He's got very small prom sizes. He keeps running with a prom size of 10. That's, that's all he does. Um, and he keeps doing one or two hosts. Um, so Bob, and let's see, job sizes, he's, he's in the lower MPI counts too. So I think the short of it is Bob's just running very, lots of very small problems. Um, maybe that's if I was a Lulush, maybe if Lulush were an app and I were a developer, maybe I'd say, I wanna go see what I can do to improve the performance of very small problems maybe. 
right? Maybe Bob's got some good reasons for doing this. Um, besides Bob, um, I wonder what, are there any interesting compiler correlations? You know, what, what compilers are working really well for us? This one's a bit of a trick question, right? There, there's a bit of a, but I'm gonna ask it anyways. Um, what, are, what are the compilers that are behaving poorly or not? What compiler works best for us? Throw it in chat if you, if you think you got a theory. And ignore the fact I already told you there's a bit of a trick question there. Yeah, Intel. Again, this one's a pretty quick start. Well, Intel, um, I select the highest figure merit and I'm starting to see GNU. Hmm. Um, so let's start with GNU. Uh, we could also delve into Intel. Um, hmm. Yeah, definitely the highest figure of merits were all done by GNU. So if I click on GNU just to focus on those, I see, well, it had those very high marks. Um, I wonder who's getting those. Is it GNU that's getting those? Or that's the trick question. Or is it a user? Oh, user grace is responsible for all of these GNU runs at very high figures of merit. So I'm gonna, let's zoom in on grace. So the question is, is it the case that, um, click on grace in the uh, user graph. Is it the fact that grace gets good performance or is it the fact that grace is only using the GNU compiler? And I think it's really more that case. Um, we can see here grace has got kind of two humps of performance, middling performance and really high performance. Uh, grace runs with relative to this data set that I generated a larger number of hosts um, Grace isn't using threading. Um, she's using medium problem sizes. Um, she's rotating through all three versions. Uh, is there, um, kind of seems to me like Grace might be just running in an ideal mode and she's the one who uses the GNU compiler. Um, we could also verify that. Let me reset my metadata, reset my users by um, I think mostly because Grace allocated a large number of hosts. So I'm going to select a host for five and six. And uh, the GNU and Intel are both represented there. So there is, there is some Intel's getting there. What is, who's getting that good Intel performance? I clicked on Intel. I go down, ah, a, a specific user, Carol, seems to be doing good with Intel as well. A little behind Grace, but generally pretty good. Um, so this is something where it might lead you to wanting to explore a little more, right? Get, if, if I had thousands of runs of, instead of, you know, Matt simulating a few, we could probably really start to see some good trends there in the compiler and figuring out who's got good performance there. Um, other questions I might ask is, does threading seem to work well? I mean, very few of our users are actually using threading right here, it seems. Um, We've got a bunch of users, a bunch of runs that happened with one thread and a few that happened with 16 and 32 threads. So I'm gonna take a look at those, go back to my figure of merit. Eh, at least here, this isn't a good, good sign that threading's working out for our users. Um, the people who are running threading generally seem to have a tendency on the lower figure of merit. Um, perhaps something again, if this were a real app, we'd go investigate. Final question I might throw for you um, is, are there any users who are still using old versions of the code on more recent days? Is, is anyone failing to upgrade? I'll give you a minute or so if anyone wants to throw that out. Well, 
one way we could try to figure that out is I'm going to, this isn't a performance problem, right? I'm, I'm using spot for some other things at this point with this who's not upgrading problem. One thing I can do is select, let's say some early launch day, or no, wrong thing. Select late launch day periods. You know, let's say this final week in March and go down to the versions being used there. And oh, people are still using version one and version two in that last week of March. Let's see who's doing that. I'm gonna start with version one. Oh, it's Bob again, <laughs> Bob. No wonder he's getting bad performance. Um, version two, wow, oh, Carol's also stuck with version two, even though it's coming to late March. We've probably got some good users too. I can click version three, who's upgraded? Well, Bob's using a mix, right? He's partially upgraded, obviously. And we've also got Eve, Dave, Alice, and Grace all doing good in using version three in the later uh, t time series that I selected for launch date. Um, if you notice for all of this, I never did a deep dive into the actual metrics. I never felt the need to necessarily click on the wall time view for one of these runs and look at that specific run. Um, we were really a lot more focused on the collective performance data that can be gathered from having many runs and the correlations we might be able to find. Um, let's see, one thing I really didn't touch on is how you would get this data from the users. Um, that, is, that is, I think, a question you would have to answer given some knowledge of your user base. Maybe if you're developing a code that tends to run on only one or two sites and presuming your users were okay with that, you could have the caliper data always turned on. You could have it drop the Kali files into some directory of your choice that it, everyone has write access to and only you have read access to. Um, you, if you have cooperative users, you could have them sending you the files from their runs. Um, you could, you know, as needed, if someone's saying, I'm getting not the performance I thought I should, you could tell them to, you know, turn on Caliper and send you just their runs. Um, there's lots of things, but I think if you wanted to do something like this, it would be up to you and your user community to decide how, um, how you would move that data, how you would collect the files that come out of every run, the Kali files, and get them into a place where you would be allowed to look at them. Uh, that's a little more of a social and not technical problem. So I'm not really tacking that. Oh, someone asks, how is figure of merit defined here? Um, to be honest, this is whatever just comes default with Lulesh. I don't know how Lulesh defines their figure of merit. I just went into their we went in their code base and they had a defined figure merit. And I said, take that and put that in metadata. Um, so this comes out of the app. The app decides its own figure of merit. Um, I'm going to open it up for questions now. Um, we still technically have 15 minutes. We're running relatively quick. I didn't lose track of time. I do have 15 minutes, right? I thought I would use more time than that. Yeah, we have another 15. Wow. Well, when I practiced this on my own, I took the whole hour. Were people generally able to get this running or were people mostly watching me? I'm just kind of curious. Are there any other questions too? I don't think I'm at a place if anyone raises their hand to speak that I can view them. So if any if anyone does, um, you just speak. Moderate. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So I may have missed it, but is all the data um, is it in binary or in plain text? So it is. If if you could log, if I gave you the credentials to log into the container, you would find a directory right here, or actually it's it's here slash demos slash user. And in this directory, you would find a whole bunch of files, um, star.cali, one file for every run. Each, each run produced that file. That is the caliper file format. Um, today, caliper file format is a um, caliper specific text-based format. Uh, I have had a longstanding dream to convert caliper to a HDF5 based format, but that hasn't happened. Um, 
Though, yes, it is text based. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If not, we could be breaking early again. Good. Get you, get you East Coast. In the chat. Go. For, oh, there is. Like this. Oh, David posted. About is there a question I missed? Uh, Greg's question is one you should be looking at, I think. I selected a, oh, I see. And then K sub-selected again. When I click reset, it only resets to my first selection. All right, so you figure merited, and then you tried, you select it again. That should replace your first selection. I'm not sure I follow if you want to come off mute. Yeah, so I selected, say, like, from zero to 60,000. Mm -hmm. And then went and looked around at various things. And then I came back. And with that selection, then I selected, say, like, three bars within that. And you shouldn't be able to subselect in there. You yeah, should mine be able didn't to move, move it. Mine didn't move like that. It, it, Maybe I had then clicked on like Intel or something and then, yeah, I don't I'm know not what. Sure. Hmm. I okay. what, what web browser are you using? Chrome. Oh, same I've got, I've never seen that. Um, I'll see if I can reproduce. If you do it again, uh, note what you click and you could send it to us in chat. That, the reset button going away sounds like a bug. Uh, okay. I. We, we absolutely can have some bugs in here. This is a small team building this. Um, there's a reset all above the table. Oh, here's a bug. I know about this one. Um, 418 out of 172. We need to uh, upgrade our underlying cross filter, but there needs to be a, other fixes in code reorg to happen before we can upgrade and fix this bug. But uh, for some data sets of particular size, something breaks in cross filter and it, it loses track of how many things you have selected. And of course, I realized our demo data sets here to, for the tutorial were some of those that break it. So that's a to be fixed. All right. I'm going to hang around during the 15, the next 15 minute break. if anyone has more questions, but I think with this, we could get it going. When we resume, Olga is going to pick up with the hatchet part of this tutorial. And that is going to be the more advanced capability where you can somewhat more programmatically control this data and decide how you want to compare it and what kind of operations you want to do. Um, Oh, what's the performance like with thousands of big runs? Yeah, so we have a data set that is, oh geez, it's almost a gigabyte of raw data from one of our codes. It represents five years of runs, of history of runs. Um, we are close to being able to handle that pretty smoothly. And I kind of set a goal for the team of, if you generate nightly test performance, I want to say it's like 100,000 runs or something that we can relatively smoothly handle about five years-ish. Um, I think that's, that's a reasonable time. Maybe you would track the performance of a lifetime of a system you're running on. Um, that said, there's still idiosyncrasies and stuff where we're debugging around getting data sets of that size. Um, the Smaller data sets here taking a long time to load are more a property of the very dinky AWS instance I have. So in your in your case here, when you click on the uh, Saturn Jupiter icon, mm -hmm. where you get a Jupyter notebook, uh, if I install that on the machine at my lab, I imagine I would have to configure this so that it opens it on my local machine or something like that? So if you go to a lab that already has a Jupyter deployment, I would absolutely recommend not relying on spots and using some Jupyter deployment, maybe your lab is done, that might integrate with your own user ID and password and authentication system. Um, and if you do have a lab that does that, there's a spot config file you can set up that would say, use, use their Jupyter notebook. Uh -huh. Okay. I would absolutely recommend that. 
Jupiter has lots of security concerns. Um, so you don't want to run your own if you don't have to. If you're going to go run spot at a lab or some site, I would absolutely recommend if you're going to run it on their clusters, go talk to that lab and say, are you okay with me running Jupyter Notebook or Jupyter Hub? You can pick either one in the spot container and a web server. Um, and maybe they are, and that's a conversation you could have. If they're not, I know a lot of people have had luck running all this on their laptop, in which case you then have to move the data to the laptop. Uh, I'm not sure what will be best for your scenario, but. Can you Stefan? disable? Can you disable the Jupyter notebook part? Would this yeah. still work? Mm -hmm. um, that button wouldn't work, but yeah, it, right. it doesn't need it until you click doesn't that button. Okay. So I will just make an, a note on the hatchet side. The only thing mm -hmm. that that button buys you is it brings up the default Jupyter notebook and opens up the file for you. It gives you the command to open the file. Mm -hmm. um, you don't actually need this spot interface to do that. You can you can do that in a in a regular Jupyter notebook. Um, you would just need to right. you know populate the commands by yourself. Mm -hmm. And I, okay. I'll talk about that more in the in in the hatchet uh, okay. portion of it. Yep. Maybe just another quick question about the uh, you know the large MPI run. Uh, how it's done, do you, on the caliper side, is everything done locally in each MPI task until the end of the run? And then at the end of the run, everything is gathered together or? Uh, I'm gonna turn that back to Dave. I believe that's the default configuring. David, I'll just let you answer, David. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly how it works. So um, there's no communication between MPI ranks during the execution and only at the flush time is um, when data is being aggregated across ranks. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Uh, I, I, 10 minutes ago, I said, let's, t if there's more comments. We have someone at or yes, someone at Oak Ridge has started looking into hosting this. Uh, they're actually just hosting it now. Oh, all right. And as I said, at Livermore, if you run at Livermore, you can go to lclnlgovernor slash spot two. Um, and you'll get this same interface. Um, but it will be it will automatically be able to access your data as it runs on the cluster. Um, you don't have to move your data anywhere. It can access Lustre or NFS. And we do that with a technology called Lorenz, but I don't think anyone else has Lorenz deployed. Uh, Matt, just FYI, yeah. I, I think that's still locked down to Lawrence Livermore people. Because if I go to lclnl.gov slash spot two, it tells me I've got no idea what you're talking about. Did I misremember my URL? Because you should be able to. I'll, uh, I'll check that in a little bit, but it's... Cool. It's, it should be anyone with a Livermore account can do that. Oh, cool. Let me, let me think, no, well, I'll, that should be the URL. Now you got me. Yeah, okay, I'd have to log in, but this is it. Yeah. Yeah, for, for me, that, that does not exist. That's a 404 not bound. I, I, Absolutely. Uh, oh, let's 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 check up on Sorry that, David. That. Yeah, that Shouldn't happen. I don't bad. know. <laughs> I remember whatever whatever genius set that up definitely locked it down more than he ought to have. All right, but, <laughs> David is the he's now at Sandia, but he worked on some very early versions of this. Um, all right, let's let's go for that break. We're we're getting to the hour. Um, Let's take 15 minutes now, and I believe we would be right on the amended schedule that David started us with. Let's, let's start at kick the clock ticking, and I think that for East Coast time, that would be back at 4.45.
All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Great. All right, let's get started. So um, David talk, told you all about how to uh, measure your performance with Caliper. And Matt has told you how to see um, immediately what some of your performance looks like using Spot. And I will talk today about Hatchet, which is how you would look um, at some very, spe very specific performance um, issues um, of your choosing. You can program, um, you can script what you want to look at. So let's get started. Uh, first off, the spot container that you have access to right now has a sample Jupyter notebook, a Hatchet install, and um, the Lulash data sets that you've been looking at are the same ones that Matt was, was using for his demo. Alternatively, you can go to this URL here um, and um, the, the, the same notebook and data sets are there. Uh, in order to run that though, you would have to set up um, Caliper for reading the data uh, and then also Hatchet for, for the analysis that I will be showing you. And uh, of course, um, you can basically take the, the, um, the notebooks uh, you're, you have right now, and you can put uh, your own data files, basically correct the path to your own data files and do the same kind of analysis um, with your own data. Okay. All right, so today we're talking about the, um, basically the suite of tools that we have developed. Uh, Caliper for measurements, um, Spot for web visualization, and Hatchet uses the same, um, the same input files as Spot does purposefully. Um, you click on a button in Spot and you're able to do your um, Hatchet analysis from there. Um, now, um, what Spot gives you is convenience, convenient access to Hatchet, right? Spot has its functionality, but also the, the Jupyter slash Saturn, Saturn button to um, conveniently open up those same files with Hatchet. However, you don't need that. Uh, all you need is Jupyter um, to, to write your own scripts. You can start with a sample script and, and you know, copy it and go from there. Uh, I also wanted to point out um, that although today's tutorial is focusing on, on measurements that are done using Caliper, uh, spot, uh, Hatchet can also analyze uh, HPC toolkit data, GProf data. We're also working on um, a Tau uh, performance reader and uh, Ascent. So th this here is a suite that goes well together because it was designed to work together, uh, but Hatchet can help you analyze other types of data. Um, so the convenience um, interface that you would get from Spot basically has these Jupyter slash Saturn buttons that will open up um, a default notebook that will open the file that you are pointing at and basically just, just do a basic display, a few basic Hatchet commands for you. Um, but what is Hatchet? Hatchet is a performance analysis tool uh, for parallel profiles. So what we can look at is uh, data that's collected by profiling and tracing tools. Um, and we are basically using Python to enable um, analysis of this data programmatically. Um, you can um, use Python to subselect different um, regions of the data um, different um, and, and automate by basically write a Python script to analyze this data. Um, the profiling tools collect um, calling context trees. Um, and um, this is basically what it looks like if you have instrumented the different functions or you're relying um, on um, basically compiler information for those function names. Um, you then have these call paths between the functions that are calling each other. And uh, the profiling tools are also collecting file names, line numbers, function names, um, and um, 
different performance metrics depending on what, what you've turned on. So by default, with Caliper, uh, we're collecting just the time spent in the different functions. And then Hatchet can read in this profile from Caliper for uh, HPC Toolkit, GProf, Tau, or Ascent. And so this is what um, the, the main function in Hatchet does, right? Uh, we are reading in this data and we're re we are building this tree. It's an actual data structure that we now have in Python. Uh, and along with it, we have a data frame that contains all of the data that the tool has collected with relation to this, um, this tree. And so we can visualize what we've just read in. Uh, the main uh, print function is displayed here. Uh, it basically shows you this, uh, the call tree and how much time by default um, it uh, was spent in each function. And you have a legend um, that tells you actually what, what, this, what you're looking at. The metric here is time and it's coloring it as well for you. Um, by default, the functions that are spending where you're spending the most um, time um, will be in, in red here. Uh, the functions where you spend the least time will be in green. Um, you can also change, change this le legend, um, flip the colors and so on. And additionally, you have um, this table, basically all of the same information in table form. Again, this is a, a data frame uh, in Python, so you could also manipulate this table if you wanted in Python. But the main power is in the fact that um, you have proper graphs, you have a proper graph structure. So if you have uh, graph frame one and graph frame two, you can now compare them, even if they are different, like here. So here you have, for example, a sequential run uh, on the left, and then for example, a parallel run on the right that now will have say MPI functions that your left tree did not have, but you still want to compare so you can get the speed up between your parallel implementation and your sequential implementation. Um, so you're, you're able, we're um, now allowing, enabling you to do that. You can basically divide these two graph frames. And what is going to happen under the hood is we're going to unify those two trees and make them look the same um, so that we can perform this operation. Um, and so for a function that existed in um, graph frame one and graph frame two, like bar, um, when you're doing a division, you're looking for speed up, you have it, you will show your resulting tree will show a speed up of two. For a function that did not exist in your, in this example, serial implementation, right? Um, your resulting tree will basically say, um, I can't compute speed up. There's no, doesn't, doesn't make sense, right? So it will show a NAN. It will also show you which tree um, this function came from. Did it come from the left tree or the right tree? So in this case, it's showing that it's come from the right tree. All right, let's see. So um, other operations you can do is you can filter um, by time, for example, here you can filter to only look, if your tree is large, maybe you want to focus in on things that actually take time. Um, you can do a variety of filters and this will basically um, now produce a tree that has um, nodes where a value is greater than one. And um, you can also um, look for specific patterns in your call paths. We have a, a query language, call pass query language that allows you to do that. So perhaps you will want to look for something that has a name that starts with solvers or maybe MPI or, or some, some other example like that. And you also want um, for that time to be less than 50 and I'll go all the way down to the leaves. So now you can do that. Um, so this is your initial tree. Uh, what you're gonna do is you're going to match the tree that's rooted in the solvers. 
and um, and it's going to go um, through for, for the time um, that's less than 50 and followed by any number of its children. So you're going to build your, your answer query is going to look like this. All right, so how would you load uh, this data into Hatchet? So the easiest way is either click through here, um, find, find your directory here, click, click from spot, um, or you can also just run a Jupyter file and you manually have to um, point at files. This is, this is the file that we are going to explore. Basically, there is a, a path here, right? So um, the spot interface generates uh, we'll generate and open this up for you automatically, but you can also just put in uh, a, a full path. Um, then there is queries to, to do on, on your data. So if you, um, if you have a, um, HPC toolkit data or caliper data, um, there's going to be a different query here that you're doing. You're basically needing to indicate to Hatchet what it is that you're reading. Uh, and then uh, we will read in this, um, this file into the graph frame in Hatchet and be able to operate on it. All right, so this is my cue to switch over to the hands-on time. Um, I think it's a little easier in my case than what Matt was trying to do. Uh, basically, I will be showing you a Jupyter notebook and um, you all also have this Jupyter notebook. So you can either watch me uh, go through it, or you can look through it uh, on your own. Um, I think e either is fine. Um, just follow along where I'm going through. So I will stop sharing so I can share the um, so I can share the actual Jupyter notebook. Let's see. Okay. All right, uh, and I can't see the chat. Are there any questions in the chat so far? We did have one. So um, what kind of ascent data would be supported in the future? Ascent, um, who's asking the question? No, it's okay. Okay, uh, so um, I believe we have a basic, uh, basic reader uh, for the ascent data. Um, but I do not know what you mean by what kind of data. So um, perhaps think, this question. Um, so Matt Larson has some internal ascent format that he spits out. And I thought Stephanie already wrote a reader for that. So it's too bad she's not here to talk about it. Um, but I think it might actually already import that. I think Abhinav might just not have mentioned yeah. it because it's not, you know, it's just a sense format <laughs> and no one else would use it. Right, I think it's just one, yeah. As far as I know, there's only one type of format and uh, it's, I believe in, in progress, we haven't pushed it up yet, uh, but it's mostly there. So hopefully soon you can use it. Yeah. We have a PR that's not been merged in, but basically at least what I see is there's a YAML file and a JSON file. And then you have a bunch of data in each JSON that is I'm guessing visualization data or like scientific output data. Okay, um, so I'll just go through this demo um, step by step. If you're not familiar with Jupyter, basically up here at the top, um, you know, so th this is your path to where I, what you're running. Um, you can hit run uh, for each cell. So this is called a cell. Um, and when you hit run, it, it's going to show you the output of it. I went ahead and I said, run all. So I pre-ran pre all of these. Um, it takes a second with, with this AWS install, um, but um, you know it's still pretty quick. So um, you can run them one by one or run them all at the same time, um, doesn't matter. So first off, um, basically you, you, this is a Python script, right? But it's, it's a uh, interactive version. Um, so it has a few a few things for the interactive portion, but mostly it's it's a uh, Python script. So you import what you're going to be using. Um, this is how you import Hatchet here. 
um, and you need to add it to your Python path. Um, and then you're ready to start looking at stuff. So um, cell number two here uh, basically sets up what we're gonna look at for what uh, the, the Kali query um, is what we're gonna be using. Um, and um, basically we are setting up to read the spot Kali profiles um, into Hatchet. So this is how you read them in. And then uh, we're gonna load in data and visualize it. So this file right here is just one data set, one, one run. So this is a Kali file that maybe you've learned today how to generate. Um, and um, essentially we're saying read in a graph frame from this file, okay? And right after that, uh, we're able to basically look at this. What did we read in? So this is a, default printing, uh, basically we want to print out um, this graph frame. So this is the call stack um, and the different times that were spent in the different functions here. So this is the, the Lula's data set you guys have already been looking at today. Um, you can also um, get the man page for the different parameters that you can, you can do on a tree, for example, and it will print out um, what options you have. You can also print out um, this, um, the data frame that's associated with this tree and it will show you everything uh, in, in this data frame format. You can, this is the HTML printing, so it's prettier than the default, which is functional. Um, okay, so some of the functions that uh, Hatchet's able to do. So you can filter this tree um, so here are, I, I can basically grab the maximum value from this uh, graph frame. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use this maximum to figure out, to add a, an, another um, column to my data. Um, I'm, gonna call, I'm, I'm gonna add a column that is um, percentage of the maximum inclusive time. So the maximum inclusive time that I just showed here, right? This is, this is an inclusive time um, shown here. So this main um, is including all of these times, right? So the maximum inclusive time is actually the time spent in main overall. So now I want to add the, um, add the column that's going to tell me percent, percentage of the maximum time, right? So main is, well, it's a hundred percent. So 1.0. 1. And then from there, you can quickly see um, what percentage of time is spent where. You can also filter um, your data and maybe you, you're interested in seeing things where you spend more, at least 60% of your maximum time, let's say. Um, so you can look at that. Um, if you filter this graph, you create a new filtered graph, and you can very quickly see that did my uh, filter do anything. So we're here, I'm printing the, um, the, the original graph. So the graph frame here, and then um, I'm printing its size and I'm also printing uh, the size of this filtered graph. So as an output, you see that my original graph had 19 nodes and the resulting graph has four. So there's only four, four nodes that are um, spending, where you're spending more than 60% of your time, which makes sense, right? So when you print this uh, filtered graph, you only get, as an answer, you get main and this Lagrange, just the top of the tree, basically, where, where you're spending all of the time. Okay, um, let's see. What if you wanted to calculate a difference between uh, nightly test runs? So if you had two, two runs um, that are the same problem, but um, one happened yesterday and one happened today, you can compare them. So you can calculate the percentage change um, basically uh, over, uh, over some baseline that you're using. And uh, here I actually ended up scaling this by 100 so that my percent are in percent, not 
as a one being the hundred percent. Um, and so, um, and this is, this is all just Python, right? So you're able to do whatever actually makes sense to you um, for, for what you're trying to do. Let's see. So um, I also changed it to absolutes uh, because my percentage time, um, the, the delta difference is what I, I was after for this case. So if it's plus or minus 1%, it, it, that, that's less of a variation than plus or minus 50%, right? So I wanted the absolute value so that my coloring uh, for this tree uh, reflects that I am after the bigger changes. And so then I um, basically, instead of printing the time, I can print this absolute percent change uh, between the two runs um, on this tree. And so what you will notice, well, so your legend still basically you know, here's the default legend. So the highest uh, numbers will be red um, and the lowest numbers will be green. So very quickly, this jumps out at you that the MPI comp split for whatever reason uh, was where um, a lot of variability came from. And MPI barrier was also highly variable, 47%. And then you can quickly see, okay, my MPI reduce was, was pretty close call after that. So very quickly, you're suspecting that a lot of your change uh, in your performance came from MPI, um, which could mean different things, right? Maybe you changed the MPI implementation you're using, or maybe there's network noise, which is probably more likely. Um, so again, you can, you can print all of this change um, and, you know, how percentage change, all of that. You can, you can print out your data frame to look at that in detail if you're interested. Um, so now we, to, to kind of look more a little bit at, at this hypothesis of, oh, I think most of my change came from MPI. You could do a different thing. Um, you could basically create a filter for MPI functions uh, and filter, uh, filter out the MPI functions. Right, um, and then um, you could you could quickly look and see. Yeah, these are th this is where the, the big changes are. Um, you can also create a filter for the non-MPI functions and select only the non-MPI functions, and again look at the um, difference in performance in those. Um, and so you can pretty quickly convince yourself, you know, where there are other other problematic, other problem children here, or was all of the deviation here in MPI? And you could basically calculate, so this is just a table, right? You can do whatever you can do in Python. Um, you can calculate here that the average percent change of MPI functions was 19%. And then the average um, percent change in the non-MPI functions was 1.6%. So, you know, your hypothesis of MPI looked different here um, is pretty much conf confirmed. Um, so these are the, type, the types of things you can do um, very quickly in, in Hatchet. Um, basically, you suspected that MPI was an issue and you could convince yourself whether that was correct or not. Okay. Um, other typical things that we do with Hatchet uh, is calculating speed up between the trees. And I showed that in the presentation portion. So you, again, you have two, um, two runs. And um, this is the, the first run. This is your second run. You see now this the second run has MPI in it. The first run was sequential, didn't have MPI. Second run has MPI. And now you're going to compute speed up just by dividing the two graph frames. And um, here's the result. You see all of these MPI functions, right? That didn't exist in your sequential run. So um, these arrows here indicate that, um, that these came from your parallel run, which was your right tree in your division here, right? This was the right tree. Um, and then, um, 
you can see what the speed up was on the actual computation portions. And your legend here again is helping you um, quickly see where um, where the high speed up versus the low speed up was. Um, so our default uh, legend basically highlights red as in high, but high speed up may actually be a good thing, right? So maybe you want to invert your color scheme and you can just do that with a parameter. And so now what you will have is the low speed up will, will be a problematic thing. So um, these numbers in orange will then be, um, well, the increment uh, is your worst performer, but um, numbers in orange are what's, what's not scaling so great. The green ones are scaling better. And as always, you can, you can see the table for all of this. Um, and um, basically to, to look at your data in detail. Um, you can also um, basically grab data from multiple files uh, and you can essentially plot anything that you could plot in matplotlib uh, from using that data from those files. Um, so here I am reading in one, two, three, four, five, five runs. Um, this is my weak, weak scaling runs. I am reading in all of them. I am filtering each one uh, and I'm saying I want to um, fil filter for just um, the um, data that, that has uh, calc star functions, um, that basically functions that start with, with name calc. Um, and then um, the one, such that they run more than 15 seconds. And I can um, basically compose that into a, a single um, data frame. And then I can just use matplotlib to, to plot this. And so essentially here, you're, you're just doing the regular things that you would do with matplotlib, set title, set legend, set labels. Um, and basically what um, the data that, that we read in from Caliper, um, we've built up ourselves a table of the, of the data to actually plot here. So the result, resulting figure shows you these different functions. They're all starting with calc because that's what we filtered out. Um, the number of ranks was on your, on your X axis. Um, and then the time is on your Y axis. Um, so you can see that, for example, the calc force for nodes uh, was performing, um, what was spent, taking more time um, on a smaller number of ranks and is taking less time. Um, some of these other functions like this green one, um, so this is weak scaling, right? So you expect flat. So um, that's kind of what, what you got here. So, Bottom line is you can very quickly filter out the data that you're looking for and, um, and then just use your regular Python tools um, to um, generate any type of figure you need um, for your reporting um, purposes. So I cannot see the comments. So perhaps I'll stop sharing for a minute so I can see what's going on. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so, um, were people successful and able to, uh, to run the Jupyter notebook or were people just following along with what I was showing? Let me ask that the other way. Did anybody have problems running the notebook? Nope, good. Um, are there any questions? OK. 
Okay. No questions. All right, so I can go back to my slide deck if I can find it here. There we go. Okay. All right, everybody is super quiet. Um, hopefully that's a good sign. Hopefully I've given you some food for thought for what you can do. Um, as a review, uh, we've talked about how to load uh, a spot or caliper data file. Um, we did, I did mention that um, it doesn't have to be a caliper file. There's other file formats that we're, um, we're able to read. Um, we've uh, talked about how to visualize a tree and, and the graph frame, which is basically how to see the data that you have there. Um, we uh, talked about how to filter and, and, and squash the tree. Um, so this is just little reminders here. Um, how to read in the files and print the, uh, print the tree. Um, I've also shown you how to subtract to trees. Um, you can basically load two different files um, and um, you can compute percent change or you can compute, um, you can update existing column in the data frame or you can add a new column. Um, you can visualize the result. Um, you can also compute the speed up um, of one tree over another. Um, you would read in, again, you would need to read in two files. Um, then you could divide the two graphs and visualize the result. Um, and um, you, can, you can do other things, right? You can um, do speed up, you can do relative differences and so on on these, um, on the data sets that you have. Um, so there's other features in Hatchet that I am not covering today. Um, you can um, scale and offset um, time column by different factors. You can compute load imbalance. Um, uh, you can basically do a lot of group, group by aggregate type um, functions. Um, and um, all of these are in here in the user guide. Um, I did use the query language, uh, but of course you can, that, that is a, pretty uh, powerful tool as well. You can do a lot more with it than, than what I have shown you. Um, I'll refer you to our user guide for that. Um, and in summary, Hatchet uh, is a performance analysis tool for parallel profiles. Um, basically, you're able to um, read in performance data and you're able to write a script, um, analysis script for yourself to, um, to look at this performance data um, and, um, you know, essentially do the analysis that makes sense to you um, for today or for, you know, um, your reporting. Um, we have, we have uh, teams that are using, using this tool uh, to basically look at their um, performance improvements week over week. And so they generate um, very specific things that they want to look at. Um, that they want to look at every week. And then they present that, um, they bring that up in their weekly meeting uh, to decide where to focus next for, for their performance improvements and so on. Um, and as future work, uh, we plan to support other profile formats and uh, add a format um, for, for outputting to disk. So we can basically save, save the intermediate results um, and, and look at them later. Um, we are also working on implementing a higher level API for automating some of the performance analysis. So right now it's, you know, a lot of things you'd be doing, you basically, you're on one hand, you're free to do anything um, Python will let you do. On the other hand, you have to do it manually. Uh, so we're, we're also looking at a higher level API to automate some of the more common analysis people want to do. Um, and you can find Hatchet on GitHub. It's open source. Um, there's links here for Hatchet, Caliper, and for Spot. Um, and we also have um, 
we, we have uh, GitHub issues is probably the best way to contact all of us. Um, we also have a list serve. And that's it. That's all the slides that I have. And now I'm starting to worry that I may have gone through this too quickly because you guys are quiet. Does anybody have any questions? A GUI on top of the, let's see. All right, I'll start at the top. Is there a plan to create a GUI on top of the Python layer? Similar to visit, the GUI drives the Python scripts. So um, there is a bit of a difference between um, Hatchet and visit, right? So we're looking at performance data and visit is looking at data um, that is uh, application data, right? So in in there in in the visit world, um, you're looking at you know usually 3D things you are simulating, and a GUI makes sense for for what to um, how to drive that. Um, we it's kind of tricky to think of what how how similar you would do a performance analysis, uh, how similar performance analysis is to um to what visit looks at um did you want to brian did you want to come off come come off mute and uh tell me a little bit more about what you were thinking there uh this would be you know in visits you construct your data flow pipeline so it's a kind of data flow composition model okay and i noticed that there's a lot of you know i tried running one of the intermediate stage stages in the system it's like oh no, no no i don't know what that variable is yet right i haven't had to go back and run things in order to kind of build up the pipeline right so what's it you know what's on the right side of the screen the viewer would be you know what you show in from your script world right it's little python mm -hmm. displays but right. the left side the, con the control area would give you kind of a graphical programming metaphor and then all that all that thing's doing in visit in, on the client side is just generating Python script and executing it in a Python interpreter. Mm -hmm. And then you know you can kind of bring up the little macro recorder and see oh, the, see the menu system kind of shows you all the things you can do based on how you're currently configured, and then based on the file you loaded. So if the file you loaded up was an AMR file. Well, then mm -hmm. I have some menus controls that say, well, do you want to turn on levels? Do you want to look at ghost cells? So if I bring in a, if I bring in a caliper file and it has things like hardware counters, well, that would be something that would show up in the menu. So it would say, okay. oh, you have, I, I counted flops. Did you want to look at that? Right. Sometimes I don't know right. what's in my file. <laughs> okay. So I, I will, I will give, uh, give you two tidbits that are available there now. Uh, and then uh, we're always collecting um, ideas for what else people might, might want. So to your point of, I don't know what's available in my file. Um, once you read in the data, um, you can simply list the columns that your graph, graph frame has, you know, you can, you know, of course, print the whole, um, the, the, the data table, right, um, the data frame, or you can list the columns that it has, and that will immediately give you an idea of what, what it is that you're able to print on this tree. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing that we do have, um, and it's still somewhat a work in progress, uh, where we're making it more robust and better, um, but you can also print out a tree in a, in a different visualization, uh, such that it will uh, let you select nodes. Um, it will let you select a, a subset of your tree and it will return that tree to you programmatic, pro programmatically back to Python. So um, you can handle it from there. So for example, if you didn't know how to design a query that says, uh, you know, three, um, three, three nodes down the left subtree, you know, I, I want to select that, um, but you were able to select it visually, um, you could you could then return it back to um, you could select it visually and you could get a, a, a Python data structure to represent it 
and you could manipulate it from there like like you normally would an entire tree in um in hatchet so those are two things uh if you have other ideas um please we we're always happy to accept more ideas for what people uh want so we can implement it and people use our tool so i appreciate that let's see also to add to what olga said um the different uh, we can read profiles from different profiling tools but in the end hatchet just creates two data structures one is a graph which would be a graph for any profiling tool that you use for recording the data and the other is a data frame uh, all the pandas api operations that you have available for data frames you can use those on a hatchet data frame so for example if you want to see if you recorded papi data or some other data you can just print the uh, column names and you would know what data is exists and then you can read that in or you can play with that but it's very structured because you can do things with the graph and do things with the data frame and all possible things you can do would be either through the api operations or through playing with the pandas api on the data frame itself all right um so let's see i think abhinav answered vivex question so that looks good um david uh the slides are available uh in this container right now um matt do you know if uh the slides will also get posted somewhere after the fact um for this tutorial as a whole Surprised I don't see them on our tutorial part of the website. We should figure that out. Uh, additionally, um, there is Hatchet Read the Docs, and it actually has a user guide, um, and and it has a basic tutorial that's actually I think a slightly longer version than what this is. So that's all on Hatchet Read the Docs. That's there permanently, and. Uh, we are updating it all the time. So um, I just pasted that link uh, in the chat as well. All right. Any other questions? I think we still have lots of time, actually. Um, can I ask a general question about the whole package? <laughs> Actually, sure. essentially Caliper. Um, like in our code, we already have some timers in there. Uh, I think they're implemented with uh, GPTL oh, and something, and it's through an interface called Cam Timers, which I think came from the um, community atmospheric model and using caliper would mean that we would have to replace all of this with new calls um, but at the beginning you mentioned it was mentioned some uh, some way to produce some mv prof files from caliper or something like that i mean can you do the reverse and use something like gptl but produce caliper files. Yeah. Yeah. David, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. So in a lot of instances, it is actually possible to just um, redirect um, calls from a general library that you might have in a code already and um, call caliper from there so that you don't have to actually re-instrument all your or you don't actually have to edit all your actual already existing instrumentation points. And um, might also be perfectly possible to generate a modified version of something like GPTL or whatever there is on top that um, your code is using. Right, right. If that forward data to help. So yeah, I would say generally that's, that should relatively easily be possible. Okay, but you, you haven't done something like that before? 
Um, not with GPTL specifically, I think, but we have none that for a lot of our code. So then they, they were in the same situation, actually. So a lot of our codes at Aladdin L have their own like little timer library implementations, and we've just adapted those two forward there um, calls to Caliper. All so right, so you just built a, a lightweight interface to uh, exactly to Caliper, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's oh, yeah. like one place and not the entire existing. Yeah, place. Right. Okay, thank you. So I see a question from Johannes about uh, QD wrap reader, and by that you mean the Insight Systems data format? Yep. Yeah. Or, so, or the JSON that you can export from it. Right, so um, I don't know off the top of my head, uh, but basically the requirement is we need the call stack um, for, for that to work. Um, I would imagine they're keeping that. Um, so we'll, we'll need to look into it. We have actually had people um, mention that um, Insight Systems information is useful. So it's, it's something we need to look into. Thanks. I, I know that this is not a, a trivial task. Right. So, anyway. right. so uh, uh, each each reader, right, is basically we need to decipher somebody else's format. Um, a quicker path for getting some of that data um, is um, actually, well, if you're using Caliper, a quicker path for getting some of that data is to um, read in the data um, from Caliper. So Caliper file can um, um, have the CUPT metrics in it. Um, of course, that's not a full set. Um, but if, if you collect that and it's in your Caliper uh, file, then we would be able to read it in uh, with Hatchet. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, currently we, had, we have a similar workaround uh, where like we, we we didn't initially start with caliber mm -hmm. so so we are um using timory but um yeah it, it would be kind of nice to get the full uh, information but yeah I, i'm patient right are you working with the timory team yep right yep. so um, i believe there is a timory hatchet reader in the works yep uh, uh yeah i'm I'm using that and, and fiddling with it, so yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, let us know how that goes. Uh, that is that is something we would like to, um, you know, actually bring into the the main um, main hatchet line. That's in the main hatchet line. Oh, that already is. Yep. When did that go up? A long time ago. The the Timory part. Yes. Okay, I didn't realize we put that in the re the release. That's great. Yeah, I think um, Jonathan is working on um, uh, making some changes uh, to bring things in line with the MPI. Uh, how, to, how to use, um, how to import MPI data, um, right? Uh, I'm, I'm sort of vaguely remembering um, that we had to change a little bit how we are um, structuring our trees around um, the different ranks. So I think there might be a change there, but but that should be a behind the scenes. Okay. Yeah, we're just modifying the reader slightly, but there is a reader in the main branch in Hatchet. Okay. Cool. All right. We have other questions. Are people busy playing with the- I, I have a question. <laughs> why, why is it Timory and not Timemory? <laughs> I don't think that question's for me. No. <laughs> is Jonathan here? Uh, I asked him that once and, and he, he didn't give me an answer, so. Just to confuse us, I think. 
it, it, I think it just rolls off the tongue better, but um, don't quote me. Mm. All right. You could have a bit of mystery in that, you know. Okay. Any other questions? Either for, for the hatchet portion or the rest of the tutorial? You're gonna make me read, Vivek. Right, so what do you mean, um, Vivek, by across GPUs? Uh, GPUs of multiple, multiple GPUs of a node. That's what I meant to say, actually. Um, so I see that you talk about threads and processes, but um, is there, um, so one of the things of, I'm looking at is uh, running OpenMP on multiple GPUs of a node, on an MPI across, and then parallelizing um, across a node with the MPI. Would would you support this? Um, would would you be able to analyze? Um, so, what metric would you be looking at, Vivek? Um, ex, ex, I mean, it would be execution time. So, time. okay. So, for MPI, you're measuring your load imbalance by probably by how much time you're spending at a barrier, right? Yeah. So um, to figure out um, load imbalance on the GPU, you'd have to have an equivalent metric mm -hmm. uh, or ability to measure something on the GPU. Uh, so Hatchet doesn't measure things. Uh, if you have a tool that's able to measure uh, yeah. those things on the GPU, mm -hmm. then like, you could read that into Hatchet and then do the same analysis. OK, so like a G GPU timer like through cup D. Um, yep. Okay. Okay. So you, you'd have to be looking at like the, the occupancy of the GPU, how right. many SAMs are executing, when the SAMs are done, right? Yeah. So that, that data is not easy to get. Um, okay. But if you got it, um, you know, you could you could be then using Hatchet to look at that the same way that, that you just okay. posted. Yep. Okay. Try it out. Oh, those are long comments. Installation questions. Okay. Um, so it looks like Abhinav is going to look into the installation question. Is that something that you wanted to talk about, Abhinav, or did you, you're just going to look on, into it offline? Yeah, we can just look offline why Hatchet is not is failing with 3.9. OK. Yeah, I can't. I don't know what that error is off the top of my head. Okay. Any other questions? I think we can call it a little early. We can. I think you're in charge, Matt, so feel free. Uh, I don't know if there was anything you wanted to 
wrap up towards the end or are we all done? I think we're mostly done. Um, everyone here, I think, is open to if you want to reach out to us with any questions. Um, uh, feel free to do so. All these projects are up on GitHub, um, which is a really good way to contact us. Um, and uh, after we close out here, I will be shutting down the AWS instances, which are all of the Spot and um, Jupyter Notebook. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, bye.